بالاستكمال العجز جهلا وتصون في العيون اذا كبرتا وتفقد ان جهلت وانت باق وتوجد ان علمت ولو فقدت بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وهدى اللهم انا نسالك الهدى والتقى والاخلاق والغنى يا رفعة الكرسيد I greet you with the greeting of Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته After praising Allah and sending salutations upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم We are going to continue with the hadith from the kitab الأربعون النهوية In this lesson inshallah we are going to start from hadith number 28 الحديث الثامن والعشرون أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحديث الحديث الثامن والعشرون عن أبي نجيح عن عباد بن سارية رضي الله عنه قال وعدنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم موعدة وجلت منها القلوب وطرفت منها العيون فقلنا يا رسول الله كأنها موعدة مبدع فأوسنا قال أوسيكم بتقوى الله والسمع والطاعة وإن تأمر عليكم عبد فإنه من يعيش منكم بعدي فسيرى اختلافا كثيرا فعليكم بسنتي وسنة الخلفاء الراشدين المهديين عدوا عليها بالنواجد وإياكم ومحدثات الأمور فإن كل بدعة ضلالة رواه أبو داود والترمذي وقال حديث حسن سهل in this hadith narrated by the Sahabi Ribad bin Isari radiallahu an, he mentions that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam advised them, and he gave them very important pieces of advice, an advice which entails great wisdom, and this is a farewell advice that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is now giving to his companions. And the Prophet ﷺ would often admonish his companions depending on the situation. So he would sometimes talk about at the virtues of certain actions and deeds. And other times he would talk about at uh, mentioning the punishment for, uh, for certain actions and deeds. So in this hadith, the mu'idha here, the Prophet ﷺ gives them is a very important farewell advice which the Prophet ﷺ mentions very important points that if the Muslim sticks to these and, stakes, and they implement these in their lives then that would cause them to have that they would that would, would uh, cause or it would lead to that person to uh, have or to attain the success that everyone is looking for whether that is the success of the world of in this world and in the hereafter so the prophet sallallahu when he delivered his mu'idha or his admonishment it is mentioned in some ahadith that his face would turn red he would change and he would raise his voice and the sahaba sahaba radwanullah alayhim they would be affected by that their hearts would be affected by that and this is the state of the believer when they are reminded of Allah when they are reminded of the hereafter when they are reminded of the Jannah and the hellfire as Allah says in the Quran إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا Describing the believers the Prophet Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran the believers are those whom when the ayat of Allah are recited to them وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ they, their hearts are affected. وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ And وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا And when Allah Azza wa Jal is mentioned, this now leads them to وَجِلَتْ uh, قُلُوبُهُمْ uh, Their hearts are moved by this. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ and when the verses of Allah are recited to them 
that increases them in Iman. So they become fearful and they become emotional when the ayat of Allah are mentioned, when the Quran is recited to them, and when the, uh, the hellfire and the Jannah is mentioned. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, he gives them pieces of advice. So he's, uh, uh, the Sahabi says, وَعَذَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he admonished us. He delivered a sermon very eloquently. مَوْعِظَةً وَجِلَتْ مِنْهَا الْقُلُوبِ A mawida by which the hearts were filled with fear. We became fearful when we heard this. وَدَرَفَتْ مِنْهَا الْعُيُونِ And it caused and it brought our eyes to tears. So this is how they were when they heard this mawida. And this shows the Iman and the strength of the Iman and how Allah Azza wa Jal gave them that strong Iman that the Quran will affect when, they have, when it's recited to them. In another ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal describing the believers, He said, أَفَمَنْ شَرَحَ uh, Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, he said in, another, in another ayah, uh, Allah نزل أحسن الحديث كتابا متشابها مثاني تقشعر منه جلود الذين يخشون ربهم. Allah is the one who revealed كتابا a book مثانية in which there is similarities. تقشعر منه قلوب الذين يخشون ربهم. The hearts or the skins of the believers shiver from it when they hear the Quran being recited to them. So now if a person is hearing the Quran, he's hearing the hadith of the Prophet, he's hearing the hadith about Jannah or the Hellfire, and they don't feel that fear in their heart, or their hearts are so hardened that it doesn't affect them, then that person needs to go back to their Iman and check the level of Iman. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala mentioning the qualities of the believers in his book Al-Fawaid he says that ما ضرب عبد بعقوبة أعظم من قسوة القلب a servant is not tested with a punishment more severe than the hardness of the heart if a person's heart becomes hardened they don't sweet they don't taste the sweetness of Iman they don't uh, shiver from the recitation of the Quran it does not affect their heart they don't shed tears for Allah so the Prophet وسلم, he delivered this elegant uh, khutbah or sermon or mu'idah and then they said to the Messenger of Allah O oh Messenger of Allah كأنها موعظة مودع it is a, as this is the last khutbah you're addressing us with. It is as though this is a farewell sermon. فَأَوْسِنَا So give us an instruction, counsel, and advice. And the Prophet ﷺ responded with the following. Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions also in the Quran that when the Quran is recited to the believers, their hearts humbly soften and they turn to Allah Azza wa Jal. أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِيَكْرِ اللَّهِ Allah says. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this sermon he delivered made them cry. And this is from the soundness of the khutbah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The person that is addressing the congregation or the uh, that jama'ah should always focus on what affects them the most. The Sahaba, they would always look for their hearts and analyze their iman when it came to the, uh, the ayat of the Quran and the hadith. So this Sahabi called Hanbala, he, he was walking down the street and Abu Bakr saw him. And then he said to Abu Bakr, oh Abu Bakr, Nafaqa Hanbala. Hanbala has become Munafiq, meaning himself. And then Abu Bakr said to him, what happened? And so he said to him, when I am with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet is reciting the Quran, he's mentioning the hadith or the uh, 
and he's given us advice. It's as though we are, uh, our Iman becomes so high and it increases. But as I go back to my family and I am with my children and I leave that gathering, I forget about everything. So therefore, I have, I am suspecting that there's something wrong with my Iman. Abu Bakr said to him, I feel the same by Allah. So they came to the Prophet So the Prophet he listened to their request and what they were saying. So Abu Bakr mentioned this story and he said, Hamdala mentioned that story and he said, Nafaqa Hamdala ya Rasulullah. Hamdala has become munafiq. I don't feel anything in my heart. So the Prophet he said to him, if you are, or the meaning of which is, if you, were, if you are in a state that when you are in front of me, if you are in that state all the time, the angels would greet you on the streets. Lakin, sa'a wa sa'a. There is time for this and there is time for that. Meaning, you give your family their rights. There is times that you can become happy. And there are times that you cry and you uh, are fearful. And this is how the Prophet wasallam reassured that there's nothing wrong with their Iman. So here, the Prophet wasallam he was asked to give a farewell advice. An advice which will be of benefit for those that are listening to him. And everything he said, the Prophet ﷺ was of benefit. The Sahabi, they sensed that the Prophet ﷺ was going to depart soon and he was going to leave and die. And this is why they asked for that. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I instruct you, number one, So this is a farewell sermon. The fear of Allah. Number one, I advise you to fear Allah. The taqwa of Allah is the khair or the foundation of every khair. And it is uh, the taqwa of Allah that the servant attains all good. Whether the worldly, the religious good or the good of the hereafter. Allah Azza wa Jal. He says in the Quran, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever fears Allah, Allah makes an exit for them out of every difficulty. Every difficult situation, Allah comes to their aid and helps that person. وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرًا Whoever fears Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will make their affairs easy for them. He will facilitate everything for them. وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يُكَفِّرْ عَنْهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِ وَيُعْظِمْ لَهُ أَجْرًا Whoever fears Allah, Allah will forgive their sins and He will increase their reward. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهُ And fear Allah and Allah will teach you. So in order to attain the most valuable treasure or the most valuable thing that a person can be given, which is knowledge, you have to have taqwa. Allah Azza wa Jalla, He tells the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and He commands the Prophet to ask for an increase in knowledge. So in order to attain that knowledge, you have to have the taqwa of Allah. And the taqwa of Allah is to be mindful of Allah. A taqwa, it is an ta'mala bi it, it is that you act in accordance with the obedience of Allah, meaning that you obey Allah. Ala nuri min Allah, upon guidance from Allah, meaning knowledge. Tarju thawab Allah, why are you doing that? Tarju thawab Allah, and you hope for the reward with Allah. Wa anta turka ma'asiyat Allah, and that you abstain from sinning, and you avoid sinning, and you leave off the bad deeds. Allah, upon guidance from Allah and upon light from Allah, meaning knowledge. Allah, whilst you fear the punishment of Allah. So this is the meaning of taqwa. Uh, Ali was asked about taqwa radiallahu an, and he gave a very short, very profound statement. And he said that taqwa is like when you're walking on on a path filled with 
phones, how would you react now? How would you walk on that path? Of course you would raise your garment that, so that you, know, uh, you are not harmed. You are very careful and very vigilant of where you put your foot and how you walk on that path. So this is taqwa. You avoid sinning. You avoid everything that angers and causes the, uh, the um, anger of Allah. So this is the meaning of taqwa. So the first advice the Prophet ﷺ gives them is taqwa, to fear Allah. Why? Because every khayr, everything good comes back to taqwa. If the people fear Allah and they worship Allah, they will have safety and security on a personal level and on a societal level. Allah Azza wa Jal, He will send down rain to them. If people are firm on this path, meaning Islam, Allah would send down rain to them and there'd be no drought. Allah would give them a life or He would make them live a life full of prosperity and ni'mah and blessings of Allah. He would give them security and safety from everything they fear. He would look after them and protect them. Whereas if people commit sins and sins become prevalent in a community or in society, their ma'asiyah is very widespread, Allah punishes them. He hastens his punishment to them in this world. Only a portion of his punishment. If Allah was to help and hold them to account for everything that they do, there'd be no human being living on this earth. And Allah forgives much. He gives them respite for some time. Allah is not unaware of what their sinners are doing. So this is taqwa and it is the first thing, the first piece of advice the Prophet gives them. So this contains evidence and it entails the uh, benefit that when we are uh, giving a sermon or a reminder or talking to our people, then we should uh, counsel them and instruct them to fear Allah. Remind them of Allah. This is how the Sahaba were. This is how the Prophet ﷺ was. And ma ba'd fattakullah. The Prophet ﷺ, he would recite in every khutbah that he gave. Ya ayyuhu al-ladheena amanu taqullah haqqa tuqatih. Ya ayyuhu al-ladheena amanu taqullah. So this is uh, this, uh, the first advice. And then sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gives them another advice, a piece of advice, and he says وَالسَّمْعِ uh, وَالطَّاعَةِ to, and you should also listen and obey the ruler, the Muslim ruler who is leading the, uh, that nation or that group of people. وَإِن تَأَمَّرَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَبْدٌ in another narration, عَبْدٌ حَبَشِيٌّ even, even Abyssinian slave or servant is in a place of authority. They hold that position and they are now leading the Muslims. You should listen and obey, meaning that you do not look down anyone. That if Allah gives to this person the authority and they are in a place of authority, then you should respect them and give them your bayah. And this is because when the Muslims are united and the one leader, that brings many benefits to them. Whereas if they are differing and they are disputing and there are differences within them, that causes that cause conflict. That causes them to be disunited. Their hearts turn away from each other. They uh, do not live a life full of honor and dignity. Their unity goes missing and there is lack of unity. There is disunity and there is no strength in that community. There is no safety, there is no prosperity. And if that leader is there, and they are a Muslim leader, even if they are sinners, you should obey and, uh, and, and, and listen to them. As long as they don't command you to do something which displeases Allah. لا طاعت لمخلوق في معصيت الخالق you don't obey anyone when they when it comes to the disobedience of Allah. 
So if someone commands you to disobey Allah, you don't obey them no matter the status or the place of authority and uh, where they are within the society. So the, the Muslim leader should be respected and they should be obeyed and they should be listened to. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions in the Quran that يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey His Messenger and obey those who are in authority, who are in place of authority. They are the ruler. So the, here the Prophet وسلم, he mentions وَإِن تَأَمَّرَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَبْدٌ If an Abyssinian slave is made the uh, is in charge of you, if this person is put in charge of you, then you have to obey that person. So the Prophet وسلم, here is given an example and he's saying the ruler, no matter their status or their background or their race, they should not be disrespected. Rather, they should be given a bay'ah and allegiance and they should be respected and followed as long as they don't command you to do something bad. The Muslim, uh, so here we have the hadith of the Prophet but we also have many people who misunderstand these ahadith and they say that if the ruler is not leading or he is not ruling with the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, then it is wajib and it is obligatory to revolt against them, against them. and this is incorrect he may be leading with the book of Allah in some aspects and he may be neglecting some parts of course that person is still a Muslim that leader should be respected and uh, they are in a place of authority and the reason why Allah made haram for this person to be overthrown or to be uh, uh, or this person to be kicked out of that place of authority is because of the many harms that will come and that will result from this and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is clear and the Prophet ﷺ says in another hadith that the the um, the Muslim ruler should not be revolted against unless you see clear kufr from that person and you have proof and you are 100% sure that this person is kafir, he has left Islam even with that there are conditions first of all the Muslims have to have the strength to remove that person if they are, it's proven or if it's proven that person is not Muslim and is leading the Muslims is misguiding people that person has to the Muslims have to have strength they have to be capable of overthrowing that person. Number two, they have to have a play, uh, another person ready to take on that position. This is after the first condition. And there is another condition before that which is what we mentioned and it is we have to make sure or it has to be 100% that this person is no longer Muslim and he is a kafir. So here the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is clear and the strength of the Muslims is always there if they are united and the one leader. And the, they lose and this unity is caused by them becoming different sects and different groups and uh, fighting over the worldly affairs, fighting for power and this is what's happening in many many places now. If people only stick to the hadith of the Prophet and the Quran, we would not have these problems that are happening. Number three, the Prophet gives them a third piece of advice and he says فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافٌ كَثِيرًا Whoever leaves after me Whoever lives after me will see many conflicts. 
many disputes, argumentations. So he, what's the solution? We have, we have these problems now. We have the disunity. We have the groups. We have the sects. We have the uh, conflicts. What is the solution? The Prophet sallallahu gives us the solution, and he mentions something very important here. He says, "Fa'alikum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-khulafa al-rashidin." Stick to my sunnah, follow my sunnah, adhere to my sunnah, and the sunnah of the Khulafa al Rashidin. Ibn Rajib, who is the author who commented on this hadith, he says, A sunnah, the meaning of sunnah, is a tamasuku bima kana alayhi huwa wa Khulafa al Rashidun, min al i'tiqadati wal a'mali wal aqwal. It is to stick to, it's the family stick to what he was upon sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what his companions were upon from the Khulafa al-Rashidin min al from the beliefs so our belief should be the belief of the Sahaba our aqeedah should be the aqeedah of the Sahaba wal a'mal likewise the deeds and the actions of the limbs what we do how we conduct ourselves how we pray salah how uh, our deeds should be the same as the deeds of the Sahaba. Well, Akhwal, likewise, our statements and what we say when we're worshipping Allah, they should be the same as the statements of the Sahaba. The, the, the Salaf would not uh, describe a Sunnah except three things in the past. Number one, the wordings of the Prophet وسلم, the phrases and the statements. Number two, his actions. Al-Aqwal wal And number three, his taqrirat, things he has approved of. Things that were done in front of him and he approved of them. Even though he did not say he could do it, or he didn't do it himself, but he stayed quiet about it. He remained silent, which is a proof that he is now pleased with. The Khulafa al Rashidun, they are the four, 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 guide, uh, four Khalifs, the rightly guided Khalifs that came after the Prophet. Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, these were the closest to the Prophet. And their virtues are mentioned in many, many hadith. The most famous hadith is the Al Mubasharun bil Jannah. The, the ten companions from the companions of the Prophet وسلم, who were given the glad tidings that they were in the Jannah whilst they were still alive. He mentioned Abu Bakr first, Umar second, Ali, uh, uh, Uthman third, and Ali fourth. So these were the leaders of the uh, Sahaba and they were the closest men to the Prophet so we, the Muslim must adhere to the Sunnah of the Prophet Everything that the Prophet did or said or his i'tiqadat, what he believed and what he also commanded us to do. The Sunnah has a great status in Islam. It is the second source for us Muslims. It is after the Quran, the Book of Allah. The Prophet says about the Sunnah I have left you with two things that if you stick to these two things you will never be misguided so he guaranteed that you will never be misguided if you stick to these Kitab Allah wa Sunnati the book of Allah and my Sunnah in another hadith in an ayah from the Quran Allah Azza wa Jalla says Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran وأنزلنا إليك الذكر لتبين للناس ما نزل إليهم ولعلهم يتفكرون. In another ayah, he عز وجل says, uh, he mentions حكمة in the Quran in many places. ويعلمكم الكتاب والحكمة ويعلمكم ما لم تكونوا تعلمون. And Allah taught you the kitab, the book, and the حكمة. The scholars interpreted that as the sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So here the Prophet ﷺ is telling us to hold firmly onto his sunnah, to stick to it, and to let, not let to not let go of it. He ﷺ mentions that we should also stick to the uh, sunnah of his 
rightly guided Khalifs, which is basically the Sunnah of the Prophet. They were the successors after the Prophet And then he says, uh, Hold firmly to it. Bite it with your Mawla teeth. Meaning, you should hold firmly onto it, not let go of it. The Sunnah, like Imam Malik said, Rahimullah, a Sunnah to Kasafina to know, Man Rakibaha Naja, woman Tahalafa Anha Gari. The Sunnah is like the Ark of Noah, Ali Salam, the ship that he was commanded to build in the desert. And Allah Azawajal said to him, وَأُوحِيَ إِلَىٰ نُوحٍ أَنَّهُ لَنْ يُؤْمِنَ مِنْ قَوْمِكَ إِلَّا مَنْ قَدْ آمَنَ فَلَا تَبْتَئِسْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْعَلُونَ وَاصْنَعِ الْفُلْكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا وَوَحْيِنَا وَلَا تُحَاطِبْنِي فِي الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا إِنَّهُمْ مُغْرَقُونَ وَيَصْنَعُ الْفُلْكَ وَكُلَّمَا مَرَّ عَلَيْهِ سَخِرٌ مِنْ قَالَ إِنْ تَسْخَرُوا مِنَّا فَإِنَّا نَسْخَرُ مِنْكُمْ كَمَا تَسْخَرُونَ فَسَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ مَنْ يَأْتِيهِ عَذَابٌ يُخْزِيهِ وَيَحِلُّ عَلَيْهِ عَذَابٌ مُقِيمٌ حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَمْرُنَا وَفَارَتْ النُّورُ قُلْ نَحْمِلْ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلٍّ زَوْجَيْنِ اثْنَيْنِ وَأَهْلَكَ إِلَّا مَنْ سَبَقَ عَلَيْهِ الْقَوْلُ وَمَنْ آمَنْ وَمَا آمَنَ مَعَهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Allah commanded the believers to, to, to board that ship, to go on that ark so that they can be saved from the flood, from drowning. So Imam Malik says the sunnah is like the ark of Noah and whoever uh, boards it and whoever goes on it will be saved. They will be successful and they will be saved. Whoever whoever uh, does not go on the on the ship, they don't board it, then that person will be drowned. So this is the Sunnah of the Prophet. Even if you stick to the Quran and you and you leave and you neglect the Sunnah of the Prophet, that will not help you in any way. We have now a group of people or a sect called the Quraniyun. The Quranists, these people, they believe in the book of Allah. They stick to the Quran, but they rejected the Sunnah. So whoever rejects the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, has disbelieved in the Quran as well. So the Prophet وسلم, he is telling them to stick to his Sunnah and the Sunnah of the Khulafa al Rashidin. And then he وسلم, says, Abdu alayha bin nawajid, stick to it with your mole teeth. Bite, biting with your molar teeth. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ And beware of the newly invented matters. Beware of the newly invented matters, meaning the bidas, the newly introduced stuff that came after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. And after the Sahaba passed away. There were many sects that came that emerged within Islam and each were calling to other than what the Prophet ﷺ was calling to even though they were thinking this is good in the sight of Allah and in their view it was something good Imam Malik said that the um, whoever introduces a newly invented, newly invented matter into Islam then this person is claiming, or whoever introduces a newly invented matter into Islam, thinking that this is something good, that person has claimed to know more than the Prophet That person has claimed to know more than the Prophet Because if it were khair, then the Prophet would have informed us of it. The Prophet وسلم, he recited an ayah in Hajjat Wada in the final sermon he gave at Hajj. The only Hajj he performed. And this ayah, Allah says, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام الدين. I have perfected and completed your religion for you. So there is not, nothing missing from Islam. It is complete. Then he وسلم, says, وإياكم ومحدثات الأمور Warning against bid'ah, newly invented matters. And all types of bid'ah, is blameworthy, it is dispraised, it is not liked by Islam or by Allah and uh, there is no such a thing as bid'ah hasana like some people claim, there is no bid'ah hasana, good bid'ah, a good bid'ah, 
Bid'ah, all of its types, the Prophet says, in kulla bid'atin dalala. Kulla, he uses the term kulla, meaning all of its types. So bid'ah, it is the things that were introduced after the Prophet in the religion, into the religion of Islam, not in the worldly matters, like for example cars, airplanes, uh, glasses, watches, all of these uh, gadgets that we have, they are okay. Okay, some people will tell you the Prophet never had a phone, he didn't wear glasses. Is this how is this bidah now? We're not talking about the worldly matters, we're talking about the religion, the, the, the matters pertaining to the religion. And the things that are considered to be ibadah, whether they are statements or actions. So uh, some use the the, the qawl or the statement of Umar as a proof to say there's bid'ah hasana. But was what was Umar referring to when he said when he said radiallahu uh, anhu bid'atu hadihi what a good bid'ah this is. What was he referring to? He was referring to bid'ah as in its the, the the linguistic meaning of it. Okay? Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, Bidi'u Samawati wal Ard, the the Allah is the originator of the heavens and the earth. So why did Umar radiallahu anhu said Nimmat al Bid'a to Hadihi? This is when he saw the companions praying Qiyamul Layl in Jama'ah, Taraweeh, Salat al Taraweeh. Okay? Even the, the Prophet وسلم, did not perform taraweeh as a jama'ah. Okay, he came out of his house one night and the Sahaba saw him pray in the masjid and they joined him. The next night uh, he came out again and he prayed. Uh, more Sahaba joined him. The third night the same happened. More people came. And the fourth night he left. He didn't come out. Okay, but he would still encourage people to pray and to pray. So when Umar saw the Muslims and the Sahabas praying Qiyam al-Layl, he now is he is now saying Ni'mat al-Bid'ah to Hadihi because they are reviving the Sunnah of the Prophet. So he is referring to something that's already uh, that's already in the religion of Islam. That's already uh, Allah Azza wa has praised and the Prophet Sallallahu praised in other Hadith. But he's not referring to something newly, in, which is a newly invented matter, something that came about, something that people introduced, thinking that it is good, something that the Prophet never did. No, this is incorrect. So, uh, bid'ah is very dangerous. When the Muslims fall into bid'ah, this is when they lose their identity. This is when they are now claiming indirectly that they know more than the Prophet and if a person sees someone doing bid'ah whether it's a salah or anything this person should warn them and tell them about the dangers of bid'ah and of course use hikmah in your da'wah and uh, bid'ah leads to another bid'ah if someone introduces something into Islam then the next group will come out and do something different how is that? the khawalij came out at the time of the Prophet so this man named al Huwaisara, Dhul Huwaisara, he saw the Prophet ﷺ giving out or dividing uh, wealth between the people. And he said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Muhammad, i'adil, ya Muhammad. He said, Oh Muhammad, be fair and be just in how you divide. So the Prophet ﷺ said, This man from his progeny will be people who will read the Qur'an but it will not go beyond their throats and they will leave the religion of Islam like an arrow leaves its target or its bow so this man he was killed in a war or in a battle after the Prophet passed away he was involved in the fitna of revolting against Ali so what do the Khawarij believe? they believe that Every sin that a person commits takes a person out of the fold of Islam. So if you commit sin, other than shirk, you've left Islam. If you drink alcohol, you're a disbeliever. And if your, your blood and your sanctity and your wealth is permissible for others to violate. 
you know, they will shed your blood, they will kill you. And this is why it's so common nowadays that you have these groups, they have taken the, the uh, teachings of the Khawarij. So the Khawarij are a very dangerous group that came out at the time of the Prophet, and the Prophet warned against them. From their alamat and from their signs, is that they will be young in age, the Prophet said. They will be very young. Uh, they were very foolish in their thinking and how they think. These are their signs. They kill more Muslims than the non-Muslims. This is another sign. They read the Quran but they do not understand. They place the ayat in places that these ayats don't belong. The ayat they are using as a delil is irrelevant to the topic and they are applying it in other than its place. So this is again from their science. Then what happened after the Khawarij? Another group came out and they are called the Qadariya. This is at the time of the Sahaba, after the Prophet passed away. He warned the Sahabas and he knew there would be a group coming. Allah gave him this wahi and he said, uh, These people are the Majus, the fire worshippers of this Ummah. They deny Qadr and they said they say there is no such a thing as Qadr. Allah does not decree anything. Ibn Umar radiallahu an, he was alive at that time, Abdullah ibn Umar. And he said to them, he said, These people are free from me, I am free from them. They have nothing to do with me. Why? Because they deny Qadr. They're now denying a pillar from the pillars of Iman. They say everything that you do, you create it yourself. Now if you kill someone, Allah did not decree that. If you uh, go Hajj, Allah did not decree that. Allah only comes to know after you have completed that action. Meaning that Allah's knowledge is efficient. Then after that, uh, another group came after the Sahaba passed away at the time of the Tabi'een. And these are known as the Murji'ah. The Murji'ah are now going against the teachings or the ideology of the Khawarij. The Murji'ah went to the other extreme and they said that there is no such a thing as disbelief. Every person is a Muslim, no matter how many sins you commit, no matter how, uh, if you commit shirk, you stay a Muslim. Jibreel, salam, the Prophet and Fir'aun have the same iman. This is what they believed. Okay, so this is what they believed and they said, uh, this is now, if a person commits as many sins as they can, that doesn't harm their iman, it doesn't affect their iman. They were going against the first group, the Khawarij. And then another group came after that, and they are known as the, they are known as the Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila, what did they say? They are now going against the ideology of the first two groups, the Murji'a and the Khawarij. And they said, let's be in a moderate path. Let's take a, 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 a middle path. So the person who commits sins, uh, they are, they are in between two states or two uh, places. They are not considered to be a Muslim or a disbeliever. They are in the middle. But in the hereafter, they will be in the hellfire. They will abide in the hellfire. So in that sense, they have disagreed. they agreed with the Khawarij in the second part of their statement, so they believe. Like in the first part, they said, we don't give him a ruling in this world. This person is in the middle. We don't say he's a believer or a, a kafir. Then another group came and they're called the Jahmiya, the uh, Jama'ah or the people of Jahm bin Safwan. This man, he denied all of the names and attributes of Allah. He said, Allah doesn't have names, Allah does not have any attributes. And it's just what? That if a person has no name or an attribute or description, then that means that person does not exist, right? This is what he's, he believed was, and this is what he believed. He was killed. And then another group came. Uh, called uh, many many groups came after that so they were all the, the groups that deny the names and attributes of Allah like the Asha'i for example they deny the names some of the attributes of Allah they're the closest to Ahlul Sunnah okay? then another group came and all of these groups were taking the teachings from the, uh, the, the, the philosophers, the Greek philosophers and the Muslim should be upon the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stick to his sunnah when it comes to his belief, his etiqad about Allah, 
about the names of Allah, about the attributes of Allah, about how Allah Azza wa Jal controls the world, about the Qadr, about giving rulings. And this is why the Prophet said, Bid'ah is the most dangerous thing a person. It, all of it is misguidance. After that, the Prophet says, فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ Every bid'ah, every newly invented matter is an innovation. And every innovation is misguidance. وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ In another narration, وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ Every misguidance will be in a hellfire. So the, uh, this hadith entails very important points and very important pieces of advice that the Muslim should always uh, look and refer back to and number one it's the taqwa of Allah <clears throat> secondly it is uh, obeying and uh, listening to the Muslim ruler number three sticking to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa number four following the guidance of the rightly guided Khalifs Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and these were of course the men who inherited that knowledge from the Prophet and they were the successors of the Prophet passed away and also be, uh, being vigilant and staying away from bid'ah all of its types how do we know what is bid'ah how do we know what's not bid'ah we look at the book and the sunnah of the Prophet if we find it in there, then it is something legislated. If it's not in there, then it's bid'ah. There is no third uh, statement or third uh, opinion. And the Muslim should not have any opinion when it comes to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah. Okay, so you cannot come up with your own types of ibadah. You worship Allah how you want. No. Then if you do that, Islam would become like Christianity. Every person would add something to the book or remove something from the book or change and distort the meanings of the verses. This is not how Islam is. Islam is preserved. It is protected by Allah. It is the Sunnah and the Quran. And every Muslim has to follow, how it, follow the book and the Sunnah how they are. Ahl Sunnah al Jamaa. So they are known as Ahl Sunnah or the Firqat uh, al like the Prophet mentioned or Ta'ifat al they have many names names don't really make a difference a person can claim to be upon the Sunnah and he is at the same time cursing the Sahaba like the Shias do a person can be a Khariji declaring Muslims to be non-Muslims but at the same time say that he is Sunni so the Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah or those upon the way of the Salaf or the um, saved sect al firqatul Najiyah all of these mean the same so we look at the i'tiqad the, the belief about Iman okay so al Sunnah have these a person will leave al Sunnah or they will uh, go out of the Sunnah but they, still can be, they can still be Muslim that does not take them out of the fold of Islam so number one, they, what they say about Iman, if, of course, and the Sunnah, and this is what the Prophet ﷺ told us, their belief is that Al Iman Yazid wa Yanqus, Al Iman Qawlun wa Amalun wa Atiqad. It is a statement and it is an action and a belief. It increases and decreases. If a person now says that Iman is not, it doesn't include actions. And that person, of course, is now uh, agreeing with the murjia. If they say that iman doesn't decrease or increase, they haven't. Uh, of course, we look at what's causing this person to say this. Is it out of ignorance or are they fully aware of this and they have the knowledge but yet still denying it? We don't give rulings, obviously. Like him, this is how the mizan is and the measure is always we look at their belief. The, when it comes to the names and attributes of Allah, what do they say about this? As Sifat. So Al Iman, As Sifat, As Sahaba. These are the main, but of course there are more. There's like seven 
اصول اهل سنت والجماعه the foundations of اهل سنت والجماعه these are the main ones we look at and this is now uh, the distinguishing factor between the sunni the uh, person who is upon the sunnah and the person who is outside of the sunnah even though they still claim to be from al sunnah and sunni when a person says sunni it can have two meanings it can be used as someone any muslim other than the shia okay yes sunnis of course but at the same time there is another uh, meaning of sunni anyone who is upon what the prophet sallallahu was upon his sahaba were upon in their belief in the uh, statements in the actions then this is the sunni so inshallah ta'ala i hope that answers your question okay we'll stop here inshallah and carry from there فراجع ها ودع عنك المضينا فما بالبطء تدرك ما طلبتا ولا تختل بمالك والها عنه فليس المال إلا ما علمتا وليس لجاهل في الناس مغن ولو ملك العراق له تأتا